and welcome to the Prigya Arora show where we discuss law, innovation and entrepreneurship with people who have been there and done that. My name is Prigya Arora, founder of PA Legal, an intellectual property law firm in India and a guest for today is Stephen L. Anderson. He is a trademark and branding lawyer and founder of Anderson Law. Welcome, Stephen, on the show. Thank you. So, Stephen, we'll start with your life story and how did you become a branding lawyer? <laughs> well, um, actually, when I was in my penultimate year of high school, it was the time that I finally decided to go to college at all. But I knew immediately that I was attracted to law, government, and politics in particular. Um, I had spent, I was fortunate enough to win a contest of young men who, they had a program up in Sacramento, California, where they sent uh, the top high school student of each high school. And for some reason, they selected me. I was uh, most improved. Uh, up there at Boys State is what it was called, but presented by the American Legion, I realized that I really had an affinity for an interest in law and government, the, if you will, the branches of government and how uh, things work. And at that time, I really was determined to get a firsthand look at that. So um, I ended up going to the University of Southern California, where they had a politics in Washington program. And there I spent about seven or eight months living in Washington, D.C., where I was able to uh, serve as a Senate uh, intern uh, for the majority leader's office. At the time, uh, Ronald Reagan was the president and the Republicans were in power. Um, when they asked me, a young man, I was, what, 17, 18 years old, which whether I was Republican or Democrat, I just chose the opportunity to get, if you will, the closest to the flame that I might be able to. And if you will, at that time, uh, it was very hip to be square, if you will, you know, so I traded in my T-shirt and skateboard <laughs> for a suit and tie, and I went to Washington, D.C., and there um, I was both, uh, how you say, uh, enchanted and disenchanted by the experience because um, having an opportunity to get so close to the flame, if you will, I may have got a little bit singed. Um, and that's by, if you will, the role that money plays in American politics in getting decisions made. Mm -hmm. uh, did not suit my view. Um, so at that time, I was really looking for something else to do. I knew I was going to law school. I knew I was going to go to Washington, D.C., and I knew that it was going to be Georgetown. So at Georgetown Law, that took me on a different twist where I became interested in criminal law. And um, I ended up working at the Washington, D.C. Public Defender's Office. I worked in a different prisoner's rights program, and I actually taught a class to prisoners inside Lorton Penitentiary um, about street law and the rights and responsibilities that uh, people have uh, related to the law. Um, following that, I returned to Los Angeles, where I became a deputy district attorney. I spent uh, nearly three years prosecuting um, uh, criminal offenses from misdemeanors to felonies. Uh, I was there at the time where the Rodney King riots broke out. I was there up until the time of the O.J. Simpson trial. Mm -hmm. I was placed in East L.A., Inglewood, South Central. And I really did a tour of duty. But what I'm most proud of was that, if you will, I didn't have uh, fear, but I ha knew I had responsibility. Yeah. So in some cases where you get to become the public prosecutor, there are tough decisions to be made and, and, and often, often was able to make hopefully the right ones. 
but eventually, if you will, the life of a criminal lawyer uh, became too much in that my days were surrounded with crime, criminals, victims, their pain, and even the, the bad guys who went to jail were not quite happy. So uh, again, the, the relationship that a lawyer has uh, to do a job can often, how you say, determine who they become inside. Okay. And to me, it was just too uh, difficult in that, uh, well, again, it's real life. And yeah. and again, there are certain things that just didn't say. But you know what was the most interesting thing was? I felt that I was extremely well qualified to do litigation. And while I was blessed to have tried more than 35 jury trials, thousands of preliminary hearings and whatnot, I really felt that my sword was blunting because I was no longer writing. As a, as a prosecutor, you spend your day questioning witnesses. You rarely write briefs. Mm. And after about three years, uh, I felt that how you say my skills could be honed better than continuing in the spot I was. Mm -hmm. So at that time, I was very fortunate to meet a, a man who needed some assistance in a number of IP cases. Um, I was able to take over from an attorney who was retiring. And I immediately started with so, three of the most exciting cases you could imagine. One was on behalf of Hard Rock Cafe, yeah, And they were trying to stop all the vendors on the Venice boardwalk from selling illegal and, and infringing shirts. Another case was on behalf of uh, 20th Century Fox, The Simpsons, which yeah. was very similar. And finally, the third was with Tag Hewer watches. Um, and in each of those cases, we I was, how you say, presented with the task of obtaining an injunction an order for seizure, where yeah. at that time we could go down with uniformed or non-uniformed, rather mm -hmm. non-uniformed mm -hmm. police personnel who had the right to serve a injunction. And they often had weapons and they would come down and we would literally serve the individuals who were often John Doe's um, based on the presentation of the evidence that was conducted by our investigators, namely taking photographs and counting and yeah. uh, identifying the products that they had seen. Um, so it was a fabulous opportunity for me to begin my own solo practice um, with, uh, if you will, a mentor who was able to show me what I needed to do. Yeah, And um, I fortunately met a few lawyers who also were, how you say, of need of IP attorneys. And my interest became, fortunately, exclusively devoted to this practice. Oftentimes, people would ask me to handle a criminal case or a family law case. And I had the responsibility and both the privilege of saying, no, I've got to stay within my, uh, and this was early on, to stay within my wheelhouse. Again, this was uh, in the early 1990s. I was able to do all of the uh, copyright renewals for a famous actor and artist named Red Skelton, mm -hmm. who um, at that time, the Copyright Act permitted renewals that were mandatory. In other words, if you didn't file, you could lose the rights. Today, the, through the Sonny Bono extension, mm -hmm. they're all guaranteed as the life of the author plus 70 years. Okay. But um, back then you had to renew your copyright registrations. Um, so that was another thing. Anyway, mm -hmm. as a result, I was able to build a firm and a practice that was exclusively an IP. Yeah. Um, and through the years, again, I've worked for a number of uh, well-known IP firms after that. And until uh, my partner at the time, what, what happened was I was representing Anheuser-Busch, uh, Budweiser, in a, a multinational litigation that mm -hmm. sent me to Korea and Hong Kong and Taiwan to supervise and coordinate each of the individual cases so they didn't end up saying things or arguing in different jurisdictions what 
they were saying elsewhere. Um, Queen's Council uh, had coordinated on the end of the company called Budweiser Budvar of uh, Czech, Budoviki, Czechoslovakia, Czechoslovakia her, at the time, it's the Czech Republic now. Um, anyway, so uh, this was an interesting opportunity. I, I was in, found myself in Hong Kong in the early 1990s and I went to an internet cafe and I brought up, home, homesick, I brought up a few websites I could see. And it dawned on me that the same products could be viewed online by everyone. And suddenly through the internet, if you will, both branding and product knowledge or acquired distinctiveness, as we call it, could be obtained through a machine yeah. rather than the old school marketing methods. Um, working for Budweiser, uh, I had an opportunity to learn about uh, product placement mm -hmm. and advertising and, 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 and how they did their multinational through their own in-house advertising company. And I became very interested in the creative aspects yeah. as well. Um, not just the legal aspects, but the create and the often the connect or disconnect between <laughs> marketing department and the legal uh, department, which often, you know, can lead to some IP issues. So anyway, um, ultimately, uh, I went to my boss at the time and I said, we should create a law firm that addresses internet disputes like domain names and things like that. And he said to me, we've done it this way for the last hundred years. <laughs> we'll continue to do it the next hundred years. He was uh, a man of, uh, from India yeah. um, who uh, was a, a fabulous uh, boss and gave me some opportunities that otherwise I wouldn't be able to have. And I disputed his belief that the internet had not fundamentally made a change in both the way we uh, understand law, especially in the field of IP, and how we relate to others around the world with the issues that are going to happen with or without intent. Yeah. Um, I know, for example, I have the palm of my hand. There's the palm pilot, the palm tree, and in every language, there's a word for palm or sun. And whether it be sun microsystems or soul cerveza, beer, um, the question is, who has the right to use such simplified words and images? And uh, also the interaction between the dot coms and the national TLDs. Well, all these things were ruminating in my mind in the early uh, 90s. And I really set the task to, to attend to those issues. So again, while I may have at times wanted to give up, <laughs> you know, today, it's no different. Today is a whole new frontier. It's all about NFTs and virtual worlds, coins, and currencies. Mm -hmm. And I've continued, again, through a program such as INTA, the International Trademark Association, uh, and other uh, particularly firms and, and experiences with uh, colleagues around the world tried to really stay up on um, what is IP? How do we address the issues internationally? And what is fundamentally fair in terms of um, these issues? I see oftentimes people will ask me if they use a certain mark or own or possess a certain mark, if they might prevail in a case involving another mark or issue, of course. And to some extent, while the question is typically one that we as lawyers would like to say it's a legal issue, it isn't always because in terms of fact, it's the consumer's belief and understanding of who and where the product as made, as I call it, the source and origin of those goods. And oftentimes through, again, I'm, I'm speaking to India from California, we may have a different association with certain words, brands, sounds, mm -hmm. and symbols. My favorite example is Delta. Mm -hmm. Delta, the triangle, is the fourth letter of the Greek alphabet. 
It yeah. predated the English language and it's been found on pottery in ancient Greece. As such, when someone might say I'm Delta Airlines or Delta Faucets or Delta Dental, that they only have a piece of that recognition and understanding of what that brand might mean to consumers. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can go on the Tri-Delta sorority, <laughs> but again, I don't believe there is, if you will, a always a fine line or a rule that one might apply in many of these cases. And that's yeah. what makes IP so darn interesting is mm -hmm. that, you know, it's really like, a chess game that you play on multiple levels. <laughs> so uh, that's why it's always fascinated me. And that's why I've always uh, engaged in this type of practice. Now, throughout the last 30 years of practice, um, I've had cases in maybe 13 different federal uh, jurisdictions. That is states outside of California where yeah tried cases or handled uh, IP matters. And um, anyway, uh, it's, I was talking to some people yesterday about it. And I think the most interesting thing we also get to do that our other attorneys that don't practice IP get to do is really travel and face time and work and understand through conferences and our colleagues worldwide. And the second point I want to make is that IP attorneys, even the best litigators, have to be sharp at solving problems that clients have and seeing an end result sometimes that might never have occurred to a, a, a typical litigator. In other words, a license, a, a, a assignment, a, a joint venture. You know, and we think about how brands can be associated, like ketchup and McDonald's. Again, for many years, they only served Heinz, and now they have their own McDonald's brand of ketchup. Mm -hmm. So, um, again, where brands are associated through movie tie-ins, through product placement, and even through joint branding, you know, uh, where you might see two or three products sold together, or presented together as a consumer solution or opportunity. Okay. So those I think are the most interesting, the licenses, the joint ventures, you know, the transactional work. Absolutely. And, and the advertising, absolutely. So Steve, uh, Stephen, you have been in this industry since 30 years. You, you, you have seen uh, different phases of IP. At the time you might have started, the IP laws were just developing. They were just coming in and, you know, starting. The laws were different. Now the laws are different. So what in, like you just told in the current scenario, we have NFTs, we have crypto, we have so many latest technologies and people building are building their brands in metaverse and things like that, where infringement can happen to a greater extent. So what do you think that, you know, small, small aspects like pe what people can keep in their mind while starting their own business or while keeping their business name? Well, um, again, I, I think the most uh, important thing to keep in mind is doing an adequate search. And uh, I think it was the Harvard uh, report a few years back that said, basically, all the words are taken. Everything yeah. in the English language is taken. Um, and I, I, again, I, that's not exactly I'm paraphrasing. But they said, if you went through the dictionary and compared it to brands, and again, I gave you examples mm. where... Um, I had a project that I assigned to my law clerks years ago. I called it the Delta Project. Mm -hmm. And they came up with over 70 different registrations for the word Delta. And again, how do you make a good source origin uh, connection when there's even more than one in a class? But constantly, if you will, these are issues that the market should decide. The consumer should decide. Um, again, big brands sometimes will bully smaller brands not to use a certain uh, uh, designation, 
And in other cases, that designation may or may not be something that the consumer can uh, see functioning as a trademark. That's a new issue the trademark office is handling here in the States. Um, but also to comment quickly on your earlier uh, observation, yes, the law has changed. Um, since I started, they had the DMCA, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which uh, provides protections for music and software mm -hmm. and digital recording and streaming, um, and video, and just about a number of other uh what I was meant to suggest in my mind is that as laws change to address the new technologies or distribution models, NFTs you mentioned, you know, one of these days, someone's going to have to address this issue that is a real hot potato. And namely, um, what is the true value of a virtual token, a yes. virtual ownership of uh, um, immaterial products or mm -hmm. items. So again, uh, while we today uh, see the market uh, turning towards the metaverse, and I myself recently has done some interesting work involving um, both characters that appear in the metaverse and how AI itself may have rights or rights created in terms of what AI can do. So um, the point is, law is going to have to, the, the, the law legislatures around the world are going to have to address a number of these issues. And uh, that's one I don't want to, <laughs> when it comes to, again, regulation of the metaverse, it's, um, Got it. I, I'd like to think that's for another generation. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So Stephen, uh, like you just touch up, touched upon an issue like bigger brands are there now to stop the smaller brands because we have also started facing this issue. Like initially what used to happen was there, there were a lot of counterfeits of the bigger brands in the market and they used to come and we used to protect them. But now uh, it is a kind of reverse situation. For example, smaller brands are operating since 10, 15 years, but they are not part of a big band, brand. Then big brands would come up and try to, you know, trademark something similar to the smaller brand so that they can use their goodwill and acquire more and more companies. Can you suggest some uh, steps which smaller players can take in this scenario? Well, we see both sides of that particular seesaw, if you will. Yes. Um, recently, there it's been reported that a, a man who had the domain name and or trade name Meta mm -hmm. has, uh, if you will, been ransoming that to Mark Zuckerberg vis-a-vis -vis whether it be litigation or vice versa. Again, more particularly, like you said, I've seen in my career, mm -hmm. big brands, um, uh, muscling their way uh, to okay. stop smaller brands. Um, again, it's it's a difficult question, but it really comes down to how one might go about protecting their IP. Um, with every good or service, it's about letting the public know who you are and what makes you different. Mm -hmm. So I always counsel my clients that, that they should have their mission statement right up front. You know, also their imagery, their colors, their their logos and descriptions. They need to be yeah. consistent and clean. Wow. Um, again, some of the best ones I, that you know, again, I call it the trilogy or the trifecta. Um, here we go. McDonald's, the Golden Arches. Mm. And their slogan, which may change from time to time, but it's always some popular slogan that kind of hits there with just a few words. Got um, it. Uh, we have BMW, the ultimate driving machine, yeah. and the designation that's on the hood. Um, and of course, the, the ubiquitous Nike, just Got do it, it and um, the swoosh. So yeah. that... Uh, I like to use in my own advertising, if, if you may have noticed, 
I consistently use uh, my my branding, my logo. It may change color from time to time, but again, it. I think that's very important that uh, companies, uh, if you will, figure out exactly even to what font you're going to use. Yeah. In, in some cases, the Coca Cola font and color is, if you will, so well recognized that it's important that we realize what does it mean to us when we break these things down. Good. For example, while everyone will tell me that Coca-Cola is the most famous and valuable brand, at the same time, I say, well, there's Pepsi-Cola and other colas. So obviously Coca-Cola must only have protection of the Coca part. But then when you look at the coca part, it may be derived of the flavor comes from cocoa beans. Mm -hmm. And again, that so when when it comes to discussions of brands, their fame, their protectability, their registrability, and the oppositions that ultimately come or or petitions for cancellation that come by those who might claim senior priority or uh, common law rights. Um I believe that it still comes down to every case okay. in terms of what the proof shows. Um, and, and for that reason, I, I counsel the larger client, the one who is the bully, if you will. <laughs> today's C&D letters, today's cease and desist letters are written a little bit different than they were 10 years ago, Yeah. Um, in part because courts have recognized declaratory relief actions by people saying, hey, they're telling me I can't use this, and yes. <laughs> the case flow based on the defense bringing it in response to a cease and desist. But some of the more famous examples of Beautiful cease and desist letters include the one written by Harley Davidson's counsel, which mm. usually says something like, we're so glad that you're a fan of our product. Wow. Well, and 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 we we know, if you will, that you're doing your best to, to get the word out <laughs> by printing it on shirts. But wow. we have a responsibility to protect ourselves and can't really allow you to, you know, to take these steps. So, wow. you know, and again, that's a much better approach, if you will, than hey, I'm going to get you and burn down your village if you create something on Pinterest or uh, Instagram. So um, the, the ubiquity of increased trade runs with it. The increased likelihood with it, brands need to take extra steps to protect themselves and the oftentimes public response, I like to think if this is published on the internet and everyone <laughs> reads it, are they, how are they going to react? Yes, yeah? I, I, I think uh, Stephen, this was an eye opener for me because you know we also receive cease and desist notices and what, what we do is like in order to protect ourselves, we'll just go and file a suit, like you said, the declaratory suit. And then the other party uh, is on a weaker side because we are the ones who are initiating the suit in the first place. But uh, if the language of cease and desist is such that it's not threatening, uh, then uh, people would not be able to take this defense. That's, that's part of my reasoning. But also, again, if you will, it's also the court of public opinion. Yeah, you know, one should never bite off more they can chew. One Fairly. should never make statements they can't back it up. And you know, if you're going to point to center field, like yeah. Babe Ruth, you better be able to hit it there. Yeah. And yeah. if you anyway. Yeah, I was saying, well, still, if if legally it is correct, and uh, some sometimes what happen is this defense is given to us, but people are using it in the wrong manner so it, it, we'll have to weigh the situation and probably use uh, what kind of strategy we'll want to use similarly i think there's another problem and that is can be i once represented a company a very well-known skateboard company and it was uh, very popular because they did a lot of advertising in skateboard magazines and 
you know, we're always out advertising in events. And as a result, like here's another example of Harry Potter, where you get a very strong public who loves you. They really are emphatic about the product and they want to share it with their friends and whatnot. And again, that unfortunately leads to them registering domain names like brand uh, guy, brand kid, you know, again, in this particular, you know, it was, it was skateboard right. name, uh, girl, skateboard name, boy. And mm -hmm. I could spend the entire day uh, sifting through websites. Um, similarly, if the popular band, popular song, yes. uh, recording artist, and uh, again, you now even virtual character, it turns out that you really need to be able to protect that from uh, now. Now, again, when I mentioned Harry Potter, as I'm saying, for every coin, there's another side to it in that you don't want to alienate your audience. In this hey. case, um, I believe Warner Brothers, the owner of the Harry Potter franchise, had written a letter to uh, Harvard's uh, polo club not to play Quidditch anymore. <laughs> because they were using the name that they were they were playing Quidditch and they were asserting that, you know, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. So I again, I, I, I'm not familiar with the facts of that case, but it's just another example where, again, you don't want, especially if you're in the situation of like a Marvel or a DC Comics, you don't want to um, uh, alienate the very fan or supporter of your product. And the case of Harry Potter, there were people making, if you will, derivative works, their own uh, worlds, drawings, comic books. Mm -hmm. And again, based on the characters that are well known and well loved. And ultimately, you're, you, as a brand owner, have to make a decision on how to address that. Yes. And that's just, if you will, one of the costs of doing business that oftentimes the most uh, popular brands are able to easily afford and address and the least popular and uh, smaller companies are not always able to address. Right. But I think this is a very valid point because uh, sometimes, like you said, supporters and uh, fans build, help us build a uh, you know, a brand name in total. So it's up to the a trademark owner that to decide whether they want to stop them or whether you know to to what extent it, it is yeah. okay to let them practice i think taylor swift early on in her career encouraged mm -hmm. her fans to wear t-shirts and make things and create pages that used her ip in order to build her brand, which today I don't think she's quite as <laughs> fond of the, but again, that in, in any case, that too is, if you will, a both a cost and blessing of that the is. fame that it brings and the choices that, you know, ultimately occur. Because uh, Stephen, I also think if we allow it to a greater extent, can it lead to brand dilution and uh, cause a problem against us? Absolutely. And, and even, you know, cases of uh, selective enforcement. Yeah. Um, where again, you know, you can't, well, I've seen that in, in, in hundreds of cases where defendants might claim, well, he or she is doing it too. But that isn't always a great defense to IP cases in particular. Yeah. But it only relates, if you will, to, to showing the weakness of the trademark's fame or um, the, if you will, first sale doctrine that, you know, I, I've got an interesting case right now that I'm working on where my client purchased a baseball card and then resold it on eBay. And it turned out that that was allegedly counterfeit. Mm -hmm. But again, what are the responsibilities of someone who owns a CD-ROM, mm -hmm. uh, a disc, and how the, these issues become? And frankly, I'd like to think that the DMCA and the law is more predictable. Yeah. But as you have led me in our discussion today, has talked a lot about, if you will, the economic issues that surround IP decisions and how companies and brands address, you know, their enforcement decisions. So mm -hmm. it's a, it's a tough question. 
especially when one notes the cost of lawyers. Yeah. I read, I read something last night that really made me smile. It said that um, Abraham Lincoln was once asked to uh, represent a man who was owed $2.50 by an, uh, another debtor. And he told his client that it was just too difficult for him to get involved. And if he really wanted to, he would have to pay $10 to Abraham Lincoln to represent him to collect 250. Mm -hmm. The man agreed. Lincoln walked across town, gave the debtor $2.50, and then settled the case when he gave it back to his client. <laughs> now, I don't know if that's true. But I did but read that's that. Right. We, we, people I don't believe do everything people. you see on, on the internet. But <laughs> if you will, I, I'd like to think that, again, there's some role in the civil lawyer's life to yes. decide whether it's worth it to pursue cases that may not either have a mm -hmm. pot of gold at the end that might be for spite or might be for, uh, I don't know. Again, for some other reason than getting what is due. Um, I'd like to conclude that thought with talking about a table topic I was involved with in uh, a few years ago where an in-house counsel laid out uh, five ways to handle litigation and none of them included settlement. And I said, ma'am, you've got to consider your responsibility to your stakeholders and the possibility that maybe a creative approach might alleviate the need for uh, lengthy and expensive litigation. So again, I think the best lawyers are ones who are always looking for an opportunity to resolve and solve the problem yeah. rather than just fight for Pyrrhic victories. Because yeah. at the end of the day, you know, again, uh, we all need to have a work-life balance and we need to go home respecting what we do for a living. And unfortunately, that's one of the reasons why I work for myself rather than for a larger firm, because I get to make the decisions that I can live with rather than yeah. those that the firm might dictate or the client might dictate. Uh, Stephen, quickly, uh... Uh, I'll just touch upon one more issue. Like there are brands who do not register their names. In India, we do have practices like, you know, passing off and we can institute a suit again, uh, in the passing off. So what what is your take on unregistered trademarks and how we take care of them? Well, that's a $64,000 question in as much <laughs> as... Um, Unregistered brands um, have uh, recently, in my uh, view, been able to win a number of petitions for cancellations and oppositions at the U.S. Trademark Office, where they are able to demonstrate true uh, priority of use. Yeah. But again, I think that we once again need to think about, is it priority of use or is it consumer confusion. So again, in the end of the day, if there are two brands that operate in the same legal sphere, but yet are so far apart in the terms of what their goods and services are, or so far apart in what their geographical sales are, in your country and mine, we have numerous uh, uh, we call it te te uh, time zone differences. Yeah. We have miles from, if you will, Lahore to, uh, to, to Mumbai and, and New York to California. So the truth is not every brand can, if you will, sell, promote its products on the level in which they want to have legal protection. Okay. So it often, it's strange, but Again, I don't have, if you will, a, a, a philosophical bend one way or the other um, as to who's right. But the question really comes down once again to what does the consumer think? What does the I consumer think. believe? And how are they being confused by 
the relationship between these brands and these goods or services. Thank so you. again, the, my best example I like to talk about is Delta Airlines, mm -hmm. Delta faucets again, but at the end of the day, what about Delta cab service? Mm -hmm. Could it be a, a car that picks you up at the airport part of the airline? Would you believe that mm -hmm. it's a continuation of the transportation services. And I think the default answer that the courts and uh, the uh, administrative offices, the IP um, uh, agencies has been on the safe side mm -hmm. to provide those who have prior registration or demonstrable use mm -hmm. to have the senior right to registration. So, but at the end of the day, that doesn't always answer the question of whether the registration itself is effective to prove infringement, Yes. because that's a whole different question. So again, sometimes people misconstrue a trademark as a freedom to operate or a uh, opportunity to exclude others. And again, you're looking at the, the, the shield sword approach and and the answer really comes down to how does the public believe it? How, in other words, you can have a hundred registrations and if the consumer was not confused, he yeah. knew where it came from and he knew what he's really buying and knew what he was getting, then again, everything else is simply a technical exercise. Good. So to be able to demonstrate damages means that you need to be able to show that there was a, you know, I'd like to say confusion, but the truth is the standard is a likelihood of confusion. Yes, absolutely. So will the consumer be deceived is not always the test. It's might the consumer be deceived. Again, tie goes to the runner, the registrant gets that uh, prima facie validity and benefit of having the registration as grounds for its lawsuit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, again, there, these are the greatest thing about IP is that we can split a hair a hundred ways and we can argue these cases <laughs> until, you know, the Supreme Court tells us to stop. But, and they will uh, never tell us to stop. Never, yeah, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I suggest. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Stephen, we'll quickly come to rapid fire round. Uh, and I'll ask you three questions. Please answer them very quickly. These questions are about you and your life. Three things that you are grateful for. <laughs> three things I'm grateful for. Definitely my family. Uh, and I'm, I'm grateful for having had an opportunity to live the life that I've been able to make. So again, I'm, I'm certainly thankful and appreciative of, you know, the, the gifts that, you know, I've been bestowed with, the opportunities I've been bestowed with, the, uh, the things my parents and uh, my community, you know, have bestowed on me. But yeah, I also like to believe that uh, the harder you work, the luckier you get. Yes. Um, what else am I grateful for? I'm grateful for uh, a community of international IP uh, friends who connect on a regular basis. I'll hold up my phone, but right now we're missing AIPPI in San Francisco. Yes. Everyone wants to know, are we going to attend in Korea and meet for... Uh, next year's Inta in Singapore. Yeah. So again, I love my IP community in that we really do look forward to getting together and discussing these things that, if you will, average people could don't care about <laughs> and are fascinated <laughs> with. So I, I'm definitely thankful for them, my friends around the world, uh, in Germany and in India, in, uh, in England, um, in Costa Rica. Yeah. And again, and Korea and China. And again, we have a network of, of friendships, um, again, that goes deep, much deeper than, than the work we do. Yeah. A final example, I'm, I'm going to a wedding 
uh, in Mexico this year, the second wedding in Mexico of an IP colleague that I've been wow. able to attend. And again, it's all part of being in a community that you respect and you would you know learn from and you connect with. Wow. Um, yeah, did I get three? Uh <laughs> your community, your family, and uh, the way you have been able to build your life. Yeah, work-life balance, I think, is a is a, if you had to define that. Yeah. Yes. Just yes. to be able to to make the and do the things you want. I my and, and when again, my my wife is here. I'm <laughs> broadcasting from home. I I got to give her a shout out. Absolutely. <laughs> Now, Stephen, two traits that you think are useful for a professional career? Oh, well, the first one, of course, is an overwhelming obsession and drive to do what it is. You have to love what you do. Yes. Having practiced in criminal law and, and done some family law and done some other types of law, I really do appreciate you know, what I do in terms of IP, because as I hope I demonstrated, it continues to amaze me in terms of the choices, the decisions, the opportunities, and the ever-growing uh, changes of technology that really relate to the world around us. And um, how would you say the need to demonstrate these things over the last couple of years we've seen a monkey take a picture of himself yes. he wasn't allowed to have the copyright and now the issue of ai creating uh, artwork and and music of, and, and how that relates but it's it's and we talk again nfts mm -hmm. the metaverse it's constantly and daily a new experience from yeah. domain names trademarks copyrights trade secrets, designs, uh, logos we mentioned, but again, that's all part of a, a world that we call the intellectual property. Mm -hmm. And for me personally, um, the interrelationship between designs and patents, um, between product, uh, uh, what's the word? What was it that Jackie took? Product, my, my uh, oldest daughter, um, she graduated from Otis Art and Design, and she gave a uh, program on basically interspatial branding. Yeah. Today, unlike the old days, it's not just a billboard on the side of a road. That Here, is you can go into an Apple store and know you're in an Apple store. Mm -hmm. There is, you know, there are casinos in Las Vegas or around, how you say, hotels around the world that have signature scents from the moment you come in through the candles and the hair wash products that become, if you will, associated with your experience. Okay. So can those smells and sounds be trademarked? And the answer is absolutely yes. Yes. So once again, you know, the, the ability to create an experience where one sees the way a product is presented and or is given a new uh, service like the genius bar might be to the Apple store, um, that it, it's an experience that wasn't there before and mm -hmm. how they might associate that brand with that experience. So um, experiential marketing, that's what yes. she called it. Yeah, mm -hmm. my bad. I just remember she had a course in that particular subject and um, had done some uh, fortunately for her, she's been able to, if you will, design museum uh, installations that, if you will, are kind of integrated in that you're stepping into a different place where that you is. may be encountering the artwork or author view. So whether the room is light or dark, painted or not, whether there are flashing lights or still lights, and, and even the way a product might be presented um, I recently saw the movie Top Gun Maverick, as everyone else did, and they had three screens. So they used screens on the side, not just the front, mm -hmm. but they had projected on the side walls. And at some points, it gave you an interactive experience of the planes wow. flying by. I'd never seen that before. And before we left the theater, we saw one of the 
one of the movie theaters had seats that moved as well when the planes oh. flew yeah. there. So they called that 4DX or something. But again, yes. all I'm trying to illustrate is that the presentation and the experience of the service, the marketing, the, the, the end result of what the consumer believes and understands um, is, if you will, should be protected. I believe that, you know, anyone who comes up with, as if we call it intellectual property, an idea that can tangibly benefit people, it, it should be, you know, they should benefit from that, mm -hmm. but only to some extent, because as I also like to remind everyone, you can never copyright a ham sandwich, you know, at the end of the day, it's just going to consist of bread, ham, cheese, lettuce, you know, but again, it, there are some things that are either too obvious or too pre-existing. And even in some cases, just, if you will, too difficult to mm -hmm. establish the brand source association. So anyway, uh, that's it. As you can tell, I'm, Mm -hmm. I, I I love what I do, and yes. uh, I really do. So, uh, Stephen, what is your one aspiration that you have for the future? Oh, if anything, um, obviously, after uh, now almost, what, 31 years of practice, I'd like to think that uh, I'd like to step away from the day-to-day <laughs> litigation experience and and do whether it be consulting uh i'd like to be a professor and, yeah. and, and teach uh folks you know the, how to do it right uh, i have a fascination with the federal rules and the trademark rules i am such a fetishist when it comes to the pedantic word of the law that again i feel that i could be a good instructor on on how one relates and, and addresses these things when they're filing motions or presenting evidence to juries. So mm -hmm. again, as, as, as I come to the, if you will, the penultimate years of my career, I got to mm -hmm. start thinking about that. And also finally, um, I envision that I will uh, write some stories, fictional stories. Um, and since we're broadcasting in India, I will say this, I have a secret desire to be the bad guy in all the Bollywood movies. <laughs> <laughs> For real. Wow. Oh, I, 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 I would love to be that horrible white guy in the, in the Bollywood. <laughs> I could be Come so to good. India. Oh, you Stephen. terrible. Stephen, <laughs> you should be. definitely be here. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want to do. That's my retirement plan. Wow, awesome. <laughs> to, to be the villain in the Bollywood movie. <laughs> I love this answer and I, I I want you to see as a villain in a Bollywood movie. <laughs> I, I wish that. it comes true. <laughs> well, I'm looking for an agent. So if you're down in Mumbai, you yeah, uh, have an opportunity. I Yes, whenever I come to know about this opportunity, I'll definitely contact you. <laughs> Thank you, Priya. So, Stephen, any final thoughts before we conclude this podcast? Um, again, I think to everybody out there, I would like to say that I hope that I've presented the counter to what one might expect, that's been kind of my intention today, is to demonstrate that as an IP attorney, we're not like the rest of what people consider a lawyer and how they were. I mean, while we are fundamentally able to handle the, the motions and the documents and the litigation and the paperwork and the registrations and the renewals and the oppositions and the cancellations and all the fancy mm -hmm. things that we do through our jargon, that at the same time, if you will, that we understand that um, as a worldwide people, we are all connected and brands, uh, if you will, all need to coexist and look for opportunities where they can uh, uh, both find a common uh, benefit 
and the example I want to give you was many years ago at an INTA, International Trademark Association opening keynote, the president of Warner Brothers uh, was complaining on behalf of DC Comics all about how the MCU owned by Disney was costing them market share. That basically everybody now wants to go watch the Avengers instead of Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman. And they were, and continue to plot their own, if you will, DC world versus the MCU. But then when one thinks about Comic-Con, yeah. Comic -Con, together they are creating a bigger universe of fans of of superheroes Credit. and again rather than rather than fight and try to wipe each other out if they grow the size of the pie the market share doesn't become as important yeah in other words i'd rather have 10 percent of a million dollars than a hundred percent of a hundred dollars so again if if brands can understand and find ways that they can collaborate with other brands to create a better uh, uh, end result, and it does not confuse the consumer. And do you know what? I'm gonna uh, send you one day very quickly. The example of that only exists in one place, and that is the registration of the trademark superhero in the that United is. States. It is actually co-owned by DC yes. and I guess Disney or Marvel's uh, parent company. Yes. But again, it blows my mind how uh, both that's probably the only example where I've ever seen co-ownership of a brand. And uh, last time I looked, the specimen on behalf of the filing was complete nonsense in my view. In other words, it was inadequate and insufficient. And I don't believe that truthfully that the public can identify the term superhero with any one trader, whether they be DC, Marvel, or anyone else. Definitely. Namely, you don't have to be a, a character created by those companies in order to be a superhero. Okay. Um, each of us are superheroes every day. <laughs> The thing is, uh, Stephen, uh, just my thought, I know we were concluding this podcast, but I cannot stop sharing. Like, uh, sometimes the problem is that these marks are so old that at that point, trademark laws were very different and generic words used to get trademark because they did not have any competitor to fight. But in nowadays, we can't protect like word superhero. And clients would come to us and say, because they have the word superhero protected, we can have a similar word protected. But at that time, the laws were very different. They did not require the usage affidavit and things like that to the extent what they require now. So I think that- The bar has gotten higher. Correct. And here in the States, again, within the last, since uh, November of 2017, they instituted a new uh, policy by which the board can reject a mark, an examiner can reject our mark, because it doesn't function as a mark. Correct. Now, again, that isn't even in the Trademark Act. Yeah. But they've, I believe, and there's been, these cases are like once a Marine, always a Marine, or... Mm -hmm. uh, my favorite example was the one drive safely owned yeah. by a, a insurance company. Again, is the public really going to recognize that, but it's a different analysis and it's a higher bar. And if you will, it's more difficult today to get a trademark than it was 10 years ago. And I know it's probably, if you will, been incrementally headed in that direction, probably long before I was ever born and will continue uh, long after I'm long gone because of the increased uh, number of players in the marketplace. Yes. And more importantly, as I observed earlier, because of the international nature of common commerce today that was not in place back then. I mean, let's face it, in the 1950s, for me to come visit you uh, would take weeks Yes. Now I can be there virtually in hours and we can converse and use the internet and, and, and televisions and radio and all these wonderful 
technology to connect and share our lives and our products and brands. And for these reasons, again, these often create new challenges. So I'm excited for the practice and those who are interested in IP because I believe that in my lifetime, it's just continued to grow and grow and grow exponentially. And um, I think someday there, there, there won't just be IP experts or patent experts, but they'll be even further divided among, yes, if you will. Definitely. And I think that's headed in that direction. Everybody yes. says, oh, do you do transactional litigation? Or, and then it becomes, if you will, almost literally that I do software litigation or uh, that I do domain litigation. So, yes, yes. so uh, yeah, uh, also last comment, the technology is changing the distribution of legal services. I mean, AI can answer our questions faster than ever before. I can type in a Boolean search and ask it a question and get you know, law spit out that when I got out of law school, you had to go read in a book and make copies and retype. And now you can cut and paste in moments. So again, we have outsourcing of these services over uh, national lines and to companies. So as AI increases to improve the predictability and, and uh, how do you say, the importance of statutory law and stare decisis, other cases in our jurisdiction that govern the decision, mm -hmm. I think the role for lawyers is actually going to decrease in terms of how briefs and, and law is presented. And for those reasons, again, I think we need to stay creative on the arguments. And because we are not robots, we need to be, you know, yeah. beyond that. <laughs> Definitely. We are not robots. We are uh, beyond that. And as you said, creativity is something that we need to use more and more. Stephen, it was wonderful speaking with you. I got to learn so much and I'm uh, sure that this session is super valuable to all our listeners. Thank you so much for your time and your willingness to share. Well, thank you. I'll see you again soon. Hey there, thank you for attending today's session. If you enjoyed today's session, do follow our channel and consider sharing it with a friend. My name is Prigya Arora, daughter of inspiring parents, alumna of IIT Kharagpur, engineer turned lawyer and entrepreneur, and now founder of PA Legal, where we help creators and innovators protect their intellectual property. Thank you.